So uh, imagine, if you will, that you and I are living in France, and it's 1944. Four or five years ago, our country was invaded by a tyrannical, megalomaniac, demonic dictator. And in the years since that uh, initial invasion, we've lost houses. Cities and villages have been destroyed. We've lost loved ones. They've either been imprisoned or they've been sent off to concentration camps or maybe they've died, been executed publicly in the streets. And you and I have just gotten used to living in an occupied country with no hope. And that's our life. And that the army that's occupying our country in this megalomaniacal dictator tyrant has apparently no one strong enough to drive him out. And then, and then one day, some of us are sitting around a, a coffee table and the, the newsboy throws in the newspaper and I open the news and I look at it and I read that. But you don't see it yet. And I'm reading this headline in massive font size. And you ask me, hey, what happened yesterday? June 6th, 1944. And I say, well, not much, actually. Looks like the Allies landed. Do you think I'd read it like that? Do <laughs> you think that would be news? Would that just be data, information? Or would it be life-changing, remarkable, liberating news, the news that brings hope into the lives of you and me. It'd be extraordinary news, right? Explosive news. Why do I share that? Because if I was a, a high school history teacher, freshman, of course, and we had all our kids sitting around the table, and we gave them a pop quiz one day, and I, I put up a picture of uh, June 6, 1944, and we see these soldiers coming out of the landing crafts, and I, it's, it's just a one-question test. Why are they there? But it's multiple choice, because it's freshmen. <laughs> so option A is they're there because the beaches in France are extraordinary. <laughs> like, nobody answers that, right? <laughs> option B, you have got to see the Mona Lisa. Right. Nobody answers that. Option C, the coffee on Champs-Élysées. Oh, it's to die for. No, option D, they're there to fight, right? Obviously, they're there to fight. Here's the problem. You walk into a church right around the Christmas season and you see this sappy, almost silly, perhaps overly sentimental, hallmarky image of a little child lying in a manger surrounded by shepherds and sheep and goats and all sorts of animals and some men who are kneeling there with funny hats on their heads and a, a woman and an older man and you ask, why is he there? I'm afraid we don't have as ready an answer to that question as we have to the Allies landing on Normandy on June 6, 1944. But we should. We want to title this chapter, if you will, of the Rescue Project, Why Stories Are Important. Think, think back to D-Day. Think back to me reading the news on June 7, 1944. That wasn't just a story. It was the description of an event which just brought radical transformation to everybody who lived in Europe, whether they were of 
allies or whether they were the Axis. It changed everything. And stories are massively important. I'm fascinated by uh, what neuroscience is finding out about the impact when you read a story. Maybe you're, some of you are familiar with this. It actually begins to rewire your brain. It has the effect in your brain when you read it as if you're living it. That's why stories are so massively important for us. But it's not just that um, when we read them, it's when we hear them too. Maybe not the same way, but when we hear them. There's a, there's a book that came out not too long ago called How Dante Can Save Your Life. Might sound like a mouthful, but um, it, it's got some images in it that I just find remarkably helpful for us as we set the stage for everything that we want to try to do over these next number of chapters, if you will. And what, what I want to do is I want to propose a story. I don't want to worry about trying to convince anybody of a story. That's not my task. I just want to propose one. Or, or maybe retell one. And Rod Dreher, who wrote this book, How Dante Can Save Your Life, this is what he says. He says, stories tell us how to think and what to do. They teach us what to love, what to hope for, and whom to trust. They tell us where we came from, where we stand, where we're going. They impose order on chaos. From grand cosmic myths to intimate family tales, it's in stories that we find meaning, purpose, and the truths by which we live. Our choices often emerge from how we feel about the information we take in and how the stories we have accepted as truthful accounts of reality train our emotions to engage and interpret the world. So maybe a simple way to think about this, I wear glasses, right? So um, many of us do. As you get older, more of us do. Right? But glasses are like, uh, it's an easy way for me to think about a worldview. Like every one of us sees reality through lenses. Every one of us. Some of us are conscious of that, and some of us are not. And it doesn't matter which one you or I are, but, but everybody sees reality through lenses. It, you know that by, I, I can say, how's your day today? And, and you'll answer good or bad, depending upon how you see reality. Well, it's a good day because I'm healthy and my kids are well and we've got a job, or, well, I'm not, I'm not so good right now because of other reasons. So we, we all see reality in a particular way. Dreher goes on to say this, if we don't understand ourselves as part of a greater story, we'll have no idea what we're supposed to do with our lives. And in our modern world, we have lost the story that for centuries gave people in our culture a way to make sense of their lives. The biblical story. In other words, most of the world, for the better part of the last 1,500 years or so, has seen reality through the same set of glasses. They've understood reality through a particular set of lenses. Again, they may have been conscious of that, they may not have been, but it shaped so much. It shaped education, it shaped entertainment, it shaped architecture, it shaped music, it shaped painting, it shaped government, it shaped so much. But right now we're in a, we're in a time and in a place where either the, the glasses have been broken or our prescriptions changed or we've just gotten amnesia. In our secular age, we no longer believe we're part of any universal story. We're free to choose our own narratives, which means we can follow our own hearts. If it feels good, do it. If it feels right, believe it. That might strike you as the only sensible guide to conduct. It's how many people think today. It's how I thought for a long time in my life, from roughly the, those choice years, right? From like 15 to 25. That's how I lived. If it feels good, do it. If you believe it's right, believe it. Despite a whole set of things, despite the glasses that my parents had given me, actually, I think I, I very consciously took them off and said, I don't want to see that way anymore. I want to see a different way. 
maybe you did too, see if what he goes on to say happened to you, because this was my experience. He says, when you're captain of your own soul, though, and have cast aside all the maritime charts, showing you the safe route through dark waters, navigating only by your own stars, it's easy to make a shipwreck of your life. You wake up one day and you wonder, where am I? How did I get here? And how do I get home? Those could have been my words. Maybe they could be your words too. Maybe you had some experience in your life where you just woke up feeling lost. I remember David Duvall, who's the, the world's number one golfer before Tiger Woods. And he wins the British Open and he comes home and everybody says, are you finally fulfilled? And he actually tailspinned into depression shortly thereafter. Because his whole life had been geared towards finding that accomplishment. And that accomplishment, great as it was, he was so shocked to discover didn't fulfill him. It didn't satisfy him. He wanted more. He came to find out the more in his life was love. Oftentimes, the, the trouble happens in our lives not when we don't get answers to our prayers, but it happens when we actually get the answers to our prayers. We pray for X to happen, X happens, and suddenly we realize, well, why am I still restless? Why am I still hungry? I got what I thought I wanted, but that's not really what I wanted. It was good, it is good, it's just not enough. That person, whether disaster happened or blessing happened, it was a shipwreck. Why is this so important right now in this time in which you and I are living? Well, I believe it's really important because this is the story, this story of having cast aside all the maritime charts, living on our own, believing what we want to believe, thinking what we want to think. It's leading a lot of people to shipwreck. I know this as a priest. I know this as a counselor. I know this as a pastor. I know it in talking to people all around the country, whether priests or faithful churchgoers or people who've never gone to church or haven't been in church in years. This is what's happening in our country. Old, young, it cuts across every socioeconomic stratus, race, gender, doesn't matter. And for me, it was uh, embodied in a, in a particular way in a column that was written by Mitch Album in the Detroit Free Press uh, a couple of years ago now. It was right before Easter 2019, and Album's title was this, Why is Living Shorter and Dying Sooner a New Trend? And in this article, he unpacks what was uh, being revealed by a number of um, social scientists around the country who had uh, rather shockingly come to the realization that in 2018, it was the first time in a hundred years that the life expectancy in the United States of America had declined for a third consecutive year. This is before COVID. <laughs> so just think about that for a second. Our country with everything that we have, all the wealth, all the technology, all the medical care, even if it's unequally or unjustly distributed, we have access to so much and yet, in our country, life expectancy was declining three years in a row. Last time that happened was 1918. What was happening in 1918? Huh. Two things, most especially, right? The end of World War I, which was just horrific. I don't, I don't know how familiar you are with World War I. World War II was the, the war that always occupied my mind and imagination. My, my father fought in World War II, two uncles fought in World War II. Um, it, it's the one that make, they make all the movies about. There are very few movies about World War I. World War I was just horrific, right? It's the first time that people are actually killing each other from far away on a massive scale. And it, it just, it, it led to so much disaster, uh, not just in Europe, but in our country too. It just led to a, a, a rampant sense of despair and hopelessness as fam literally families are fighting against each other. Because everybody was related. All the rulers of the nations in different ways. So that's one of the things that's happening in 1918. Of course, the other thing that's happening in 1918 is the Spanish flu, which suddenly we all know everything about. 
And the Spanish flu killed 50 million people. Those are the two factors that are most significant for this rapidly or increasingly or consecutively uh, declining life expectancy. How about now? Why are we dying now? Well, sociologists say we're dying right now for, for three things, and they call them deaths of despair. This isn't happening from, a, from an invasion from a foreign army. This isn't happening from um, you know, a meteor hitting the earth. We're, we're doing this to ourselves, actually. And the first death of despair is suicide. There are more than a few of us in here who have been uh, traumatically impacted by suicide. I know that. I'm one of them. My mom's brother took his life. Um, my sister's husband took his life. I've buried, I don't know how many people who've taken their lives, more than I can count in 25 years. It's devastating. And I pray if you're one of those people who has been impacted deeply by this trauma that God in his kindness will reach into your heart, which is still hurting, and apply the salve that only he can, most especially when we come to, to talk about what it is that Jesus has done to the power of death. But this is happening right now. It's, it's increased 13 consecutive years in our country. It's up 30% since 1999. It's up 40% in rural America, and the one that just like pierces me interiorly is the fact that amongst children ages 10 to 14, suicide is the second leading cause of death. Just linger with that a moment. Not amongst poor children. In fact, it, it's, it's not uncommon any of you have gone to Africa or you've gone down to Latin America it's amazing how many people go to other parts of the world with just riddled with poverty, and they come back, and their, their immediate impression is, they're just so happy. And people say, well, that's because they don't know what they don't have. Uh, I don't think so. They're, they're just happy. Like, they have family. They have friends. They have food. They have a tin hut. Like, suicide isn't a, a rampant disease in Africa. It is here, in our country, with all the toys that we have. Like, when I, w when I was a kid, I grew up in an incredibly prosperous family. I was probably the most bored kid in my school. I had everything. It was always puzzling to me. Like, how is it that I have all this stuff and I'm bored? But, but I, I kind of learned from a young age, okay, stuff's fine, but it, 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 there must be more because because I got either that or I got a massive appetite and nothing can fill it. The suicide rate in this age group, those 10 to 14 year olds, it's tripled over the last 14, 15 years. That's the first death of despair. The second one is cirrhosis of the liver. Most especially in those like prime years between 25 and 34. The number of people between the ages of 25 and 34 who die annually from alcohol-related liver disease has nearly tripled over the last 20 years, with an annual average increase of about 10%. This has gone up like crazy since COVID. The increase, especially amongst women, of drinking over the last year and a half or so just keeps going like this. When, when, when we unpack the mental health crisis of the last two years, and we're still not out of it, it it's going to be beyond anything we can comprehend right now. And the last death of despair is the opioid addiction. We're 5% of the world's population. We consume 80% of the world's opioids. Why is this the case? Why, why is this happening? I'm going to make a, a, a claim at the beginning. We'll see if it's true or not. I'm not. I don't worry about trying to convince you. I would argue it's happening because we've pushed God more and more and more and more off the stage. And when God gets pu pushed off the stage, the creature that's made in his image and likeness loses any sense of meaning. 
It's like Dreyer says in his book, we've, like, where am I? How did I get here? And how do I get home? About a year ago, the CDC did a study. 25% of those they had studied between the ages of 18 and 24 had seriously considered, seriously considered, taking their own lives in the previous month because of the COVID crisis. They did another study, another report, survey. 40% of those who they surveyed had experienced adverse mental or behavioral health conditions because of COVID. And amongst kids the ages of 18 to 24, it was 75%. Again, we're just, the, the, the mental health crisis that's in our country is vast. I'm one of those people who struggles with depression. It's rampant. And when you have no sense of why am I here and where am I going and how do I get there and am I on my own or is, is there a plan for my life? Is, is, there, is there any meaning to any of this? That, that anxiety, that depression, the fear that so many of us can get overwhelmed with, it, it just becomes just that, overwhelming. But what if there's another story? What if there's the equivalent for us of you know, someone tossing in the newspaper and we read invasion, which wouldn't just be news, it would be extraordinary news. It would be the kind of news that gives us hope, encouragement, confidence, helps us to know there's charts, ways by which we can get home again, huh? I want to show you a quick clip. Anybody seen uh, The Man in the High Castle? A few hands. This is not a promotion for it, <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> let, me just, let me just set this scene up for you. To, it was originally a, a novel, got turned into a, I don't know, like a three-year series, I think, by Amazon. And it's um, most bizarre, let's just say it that way. This is not an endorsement. But this scene is one of the most powerful scenes I've ever seen for what can happen when another story is presented to us. So the, the, the premise of the, the book and of the miniseries is this. The United States loses World War II. So it's sometime in the early 60s, and the United States is now divided between um, Nazi Germany and the Empire of Japan. So from the Rocky Mountains east is the Empire of Nazi Germany, and from the Rocky Mountains west is the Empire of Japan. And the people who are living in the country, us, uh, we're now living under that tyrannical, demonic dictator who had invaded our country in France that we talked about earlier. And so now the people are, are living under oppression, uh, systematic torture, slavery, mass executions, and fear and anxiety are rampant. That's what's controlling uh, us who are living here in the country. And so in the very first episode of this uh, series, this woman that we're gonna see on this scene, who turns out to be the lead character in the story, her sister, who was a member of the resistance movement, she's executed. And shortly before she dies, she hands uh, the woman that we're going to see here, a package. And the package is a, a, a reel of film, she finds out as she unwraps it. I just want you to watch what happens to this woman as she watches what she watches. She's watching one reel. It's not like her sister handed her a stack. It's just one reel. And she watches it, and it ends, and she rewinds it, and she watches it again. And it ends, and she rewinds it, and she watches it again. And it ends, and she rewinds it, and she watches it again.
And as she's watching this, you watch her face change. And she goes from a woman who's living in despair, living without hope, living in anxiety, to all of a sudden she begins to cry and to smile. And she mouths the words, yes. And then her boyfriend walks in. Frank. Hey. And says, what are you watching? And then we see what is this? Uh, the unconditional surrender of Japan. We see film. bombs falling in Europe. We see the Allies yes, landing yeah. at D-Day. Just us winning the war. Yeah, but we didn't win the war. That's what they told us. Did you hear what she said? That's what they told us. I would suggest a lot of us are like that woman. We're watching a reel, if you will. We're looking at life through lenses, if you will. We have a story which is shaping how we think, which goes something like this. God is not real, or if he's real, he's irrelevant. He's distant. He's not involved. He's obviously not involved. Look what's happening. <laughs> Look what's going on. Not just on the global scale, but on the country scale, look at your family scale, your own personal scale. He's not interested. He doesn't act or he acts like a, a genie, he just shows up every once in a while. But what if there's another reel? What if there's another story? What if there's something that we can know and that we can share with others, which can have the impact on us and as we tell it with others, that that had on that woman. And for me, that's what we're going to talk about. That's, that's what the Rescue Project's all about. It's proposing another story, another way to see reality. It's not, a, it's not a story that I made up. It's not a set of lenses that I created. It's just the biblical story. It's what Dreyer was talking about. The, the narrative which for most of the last 1,500 years or so has given people charts, stars by which to sail a way to know whether or not I'm, I'm going in the right direction, a way to make sense out of why are things going wrong when they go wrong, and why it is that even when times are tough, especially when times are tough, I don't have to be anxious and afraid or give in to depression or despair. And, and I want to propose the story to you really by, by looking at four questions. It, it's how I frame the story. It's just a helpful way for me to kind of get my hands around all of this. And the questions are big. They're huge questions. The first question is this, why is there something rather than nothing? That's what we're going to look at next. That's a massive question. The second question, why is everything so obviously messed up? <laughs> like, why is it all wrong? Why do, why do children die of cancer? Why do people deal with depression? Why do we have these suicide rates? Why, 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 why? I'll tell you, as a priest of a quarter of a century, it's the single most common question I'm asked. Doesn't matter what comes after it, but that's the first word, why, Father? Mm. Third question, what if anything has got done about it? And then the last question, if he's done anything about it, how is it that I should respond? Those four questions, I would suggest, are a way to frame what's called the gospel. And by gospel, I'm not talking about, you know, the, the four books in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Not John, Paul, George, and Ringo, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So gospel here is small g. That's not a misprint. Small g just means that the, the good news, not the news, any more than the Allies landing on D-Day was news. That wasn't news. That was unbelievable news. It was life-changing, extraordinary, explosive news. It changed everything. The gospel's better than that, infinitely better than that. Because there's a tyrant worse than Hitler, and there's a good God who's better than the Allies landing at Normandy. But this is the gospel, and, and so gospel is, um, is a word which actually was a, a loaded word at the time when the scriptures were being written. Gospel meant this 
proclamation, usually of something that the Roman Empire had done, and usually something that the emperor had done. It was the story, it was the controlling narrative of the Roman Empire. There was a, there was a lord, he was Caesar. There was good news, that was what he had done, and he'd brought peace. He was hailed as a savior. He had finally brought peace to the world, the Pax Romana. The whole empire was at peace, at least if you were a man and a Roman citizen. If you weren't a Roman citizen, you weren't a man, you weren't at peace. So it was a false narrative. It didn't deliver what it promised. We have a lot of those false narratives rolling around in our day and age too. And the gospel, another way to think of the gospel is the gospel is the story. So a woman who I've come to know a little bit and greatly admire, admire her name's Fleming Rutledge. She says this, she says, more than anything else right now, we, there's so much that we could talk about there are so many issues that are worth diving into, that are important, that we need to know, that we need to understand. But more than anything else right now, we need to know the story. I need to, I need to be able to make sense out of my life. Because the other things, they're really important, but they're like chapters 79 or 313. I need to know the story, and the story is the gospel. So for each of these four questions... What I'm going to propose is there's a word. It's an even simpler way to remember the gospel or the big story. So for why is there something rather than nothing, the word is created. For why is everything so obviously messed up, the word is captured. For what, if anything, has God done about it, the word is rescued. And for if he's done anything, how should I respond? The word is response. Those are the, the words which we're going to try to dive into as we go along. And with each of those words, we're going to ask for a particular grace. We want an insight from God so as to be able to penetrate these more deeply. But we'll talk about those as we get to them. And those things are the gospel. And the gospel, St. Paul says, in a letter that he wrote to the Christians in Rome in the first century, is power. The word there, so the, the gospels, I presume we all know, weren't written in English. They were written in Greek. The word he uses there for power, that we translate into power, is the word from which we get the word dynamite. In other words, it's, it's like, again, the, the headline on June 7th, 1944, invasion. It's explosive news. If we know it, not just intellectually, but if it penetrates us the way that story penetrated, that, that reel of film penetrated that woman in The Man on the High Castle, it will change everything for you and me. And note, it's the gospel that's power. The message itself is power. The proclamation is power. The announcement is power. The events that it describes are power, not the herald. So if you and I get overwhelmed by this, and we want to share the gospel outside with other people, one of our temptations is often like, well, I don't know that I'm going to be all that convincing. You don't have to worry about that. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with me. I'm just like a mailman. I just deliver mail. It's the mail that you open up that you read that's so explosive, not the mailman. So let me just tell you a, a quick story, because the man in the high castle is a is not true. <laughs> so here's somebody who sees another reel and it changes their life, but it's not true. It's fiction. Let me tell you a story that is true, which is not fiction. A story that's been happening all around the world for the last 2,000 years in people of all sorts of ages from every ethnic background and every socioeconomic class. This just happens to do with somebody who came to see me a set of years ago. So, this probably might come as a surprise to some of you, but nobody calls a priest and goes, hey, Father, my life is going really well. Can I just come in and tell you about it? <laughs> we don't ever get those calls. People come to see us to tell us, like, something's wrong. Usually really wrong, but it's okay. You just get used to that. <laughs> So one day I get a call from somebody who says, uh, you don't know me, I don't know you, but I've been told I should come see you. Can I come in and spend some time? I said, sure. So I met her out at the church where I was serving at the time. 
She walks in, she is hands down, to this day, the most stunningly attractive woman I've ever seen in my life. So I'm trying to be very composed as I'm looking at her. She sits down and I say, uh, what is it I can do for you? So she tells me. So she's, she's loaded with cash, she's mid to late 20s, she's drop dead gorgeous, and her life interiorly is a train wreck. And she tells me what's happening. And I said, okay, what would you like me to do? And she tells me, to which I said, okay, be before I do that, can I just take five minutes? And can I, can I tell you how I see the world? Because if I don't tell you how I see the world, nothing I'm gonna say to you afterwards is gonna make any sense. And she says, sure, if she said no, it was great, I got a free half hour. But she said yes in this case. So I took five minutes and I, I walked her through those four questions. And by the time I got done with the four questions, she's on the floor in a puddle, bawling her eyes out. And she says this to me. Father, that's not the God I knew growing up. She could be every man and every woman. For whatever reason, the film that she'd been watching for years was very different from what she just heard. And she, like the woman and the man in the high castle, except in reality, went from living in despair and on the verge of taking her life, despite all that she had, to someone who left smiling, crying tears of joy, and feeling hope in five minutes. Why? Because the gospel's power. And there really is another story.